Hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and we have yet another first here on Real History for this episode. Uh, we've never actually done a genuine reaction video. Um, and all these reaction videos that we see on YouTube are kind of what inspired this channel in the first place because most of them are just uninformed people having visceral gut reactions. Um, and so, you know, we tried to, you know, have something different to that. But we thought, hey, you know, why not try something, you know, uh, something a little bit off field here, a little bit different uh, from what we typically do on this channel. And so we thought that the perfect film for this experiment here on Real History would be to look at the recent Dutch film, which aired on Netflix, that is entitled The Forgotten Battle that looks at the battle for the river Scheldt in autumn of 1944. This was a battle that took place in both uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And uh, everybody I've spoken to has said that it's a, a really good film. It has a lot of really uh, rich, authentic flavor to it. I have not seen any of it whatsoever. And so what you will be seeing here is my genuine first time reaction to the film. And I've really been looking forward to it and I hope you will enjoy it hopefully as much as I do. So let's go ahead and begin here. First time for me, The Forgotten Battle. Before I see anything, I'll just preface this and make an estimation. I really suspect that movies like this are the future of historical films. As, as you look at historical films that have been debuting in theaters, they just aren't doing well from a monetary standpoint. I think more films like this that do not have well-known A-list actors but still can have a lot of production quality, I think that's going to be the future of historical films. Really digging the map here at the outset. It looks like a vintage, you know, War Department map. I like it. I believe the Port of Antwerp was liberated early September, short time after Paris was liberated. And it was, I believe at that time, the largest deep water port in Europe. If you don't control the mouth of the river, it's kind of a, a bittersweet victory. It's a perfect outline here at the beginning. So by this point in the war, you know, the Netherlands had been under Nazi occupation for nearly four and a half years. They were in the same boat as, as the French as far as the duration of occupation went. What do you mean? Your father works for the Germans now. For sick Germans and sick sailors. In my mind, this is like almost like the other side of the coin of the liberation scene of Eindhoven in Band of Brothers. Uh, this is like what that looks like before the Allies arrive. Um, and already, like, people are considering, you know, what is going to be the cost of myself or my neighbors who collaborated with the Germans? What is, what is the penalty going to be? And you kind of get a sense of those conversations and mindsets in these early phases of this film. There's, there's some accounts of Americans doing much the same thing as they were entering Germany in 1945. If they ever saw civilians taking pictures of them, they would often rip the camera from their necks and throw it on the ground or shoot it. Oh. Oh. A 
there were so many moments like this, like people who were on the eve of, of liberation and, you know, their, their emotions or their tempers got the best of them and then they were chased or gunned down when they were hours or days away from being saved from Allied forces. So we're apparently seeing a flashback here and uh, perhaps the some of the long-term aftermath of uh, Operation Bagration, which was the, the Russian advance into Germany-held territory that consisted of over a over hundred infantry divisions. And this was uh, essentially the Russian counterpart to the Normandy invasion that was meant to tighten the noose around the Germans' neck further. And what we see here, I'm guessing, is some of the, the ripple effect combat in the wake of that advance. <laughs> Weapon that we see here is a Panzerfaust in use, and that's a, a, a one and done a bazooka of sorts, frequently used by the Germans, sometimes used by Allied forces if they ever picked one up off of the ground. Although I think the right way to fire it is you tuck it underneath your armpit and better secure it that way. I could be wrong, though. You and uh, your sissies, both of you. Ow. Not a word to him, okay? I don't think this kid's going to make it. September 16th. So this is the day before Operation Market Garden is to commence. The multi-nation massive Allied airborne drop behind enemy lines in German-occupied Holland. Idiots. <laughs> so I, I believe these are Horsa gliders. These were heavily used by the, the Allies in Normandy. And it, it took a, a special breed of individual to get into these things because they were, they were just flying coffins. They, they were true death traps. Uh, you know, engineless aircraft detached from, you know, often a, a C-47 or a, a Lancaster uh, aircraft, you know, to their front. And, you know, nothing more than, than canvas and tar and paper and timber. And they would just splinter like a box of matches often when they, when they hit the ground. Uh, incredibly dangerous to fly in. And uh, airborne troops and glider-borne troops, when World War II came to an end, they were very, very glad when helicopters replaced gliders. 64 miles behind enemy lines, with one objective, retake honor. Operation Market Garden. The primary hope of Operation Market Garden was to get Allied forces beyond the Rhine River, puncture a, a way into the heart of Germany, and there was this overly optimistic hope that that in turn could end the war by Christmas. And of course, over the coming days and weeks, uh, Operation Market Garden would become a bitter strategic failure for the Allied forces, the various nationalities that participated. And this action along the Scheldt Estuary, um, even to some Allied commanders at the time, uh, was kind of considered to be a sideshow of the big show. You had the likes of Sir Bertram Ramsey, who was very adamant in his demands to Sir Bernard Law Montgomery that securing Antwerp, uh, this river uh, at its mouth, was really the crucial target because 
without control of that deep water port and the river that is connected to it, all the rest of it could potentially be for naught. Uh, and so many historians in hindsight have made the conclusion or made the claim that the River Scheldt should have been the primary objective and perhaps not Arnhem from the get-go. And uh, because the objectives around the River Scheldt were put on the back burner, it took a lot longer to seize it and was far costlier than perhaps what it should have been. What I know about the, the place referenced here, Chelmno, was a horrific concentration camp in central Poland that was, it was an extermination camp. Unlike some camps that were used for forced labor, its pure intent was to kill as many people as possible. And I think upward of 200,000 people met their end there. And so it's interesting that, uh, you know, it, it's perhaps clever filmmaking where the, the filmmakers try to develop a little bit of empathy toward German characters, but then they kind of reel you back toward reality and they further explain what some of these people are responsible for. <laughs> You know, all the while here, you know, with our uh, young Dutch soldier here who's joined the German army, you know, there, there of course were, you know, Dutch collaborators with the Germans just as there were in France during the four years of occupation. Um, I am not, though, well versed or know if young Dutch men actually joined the German army to, to any large extent. That, that's something that I would have to look into a little bit more. Not uncommon for German officers when they thought all was lost. Keep your eyes on the job at hand. And of course, there's another wonderful recreation of Operation Market Garden in a bridge too far, which I promise we will also take a look at sometime here on this channel. This is looking great, though. That's exactly how one would envision it. I mean, you know, when you have lesser known character actors, you can maximize your budget on production value. That's exactly what they did. Some troops who flew into Holland in September 1944, some of them didn't encounter any, any flack at all. And others went through hellish scenarios like this. It merely depended upon the route that they flew in on. I was <laughs> just about to say, as, as flag shreds through the side here, there's no armor on these planes. There's absolutely nothing protecting anybody. Oh my god. One veteran said, you know, when scenarios like this happen, it was like trying to fly a boxcar. Yeah, it was one American soldier said, you know, he said that uh, the Netherlands were it was, it was flat as the proverbial pancake. And uh, he said it was nothing but these, these causeways and dikes and thoroughfares crisscrossing these huge marshy areas. And the country was marshy and flooded enough as it was, but the Germans flooded additional pastures to make these sorts of airborne drops and glider landings all the more difficult. Uh, and so, you know, the potential for drowning in circumstances as such, much like what was the case in Normandy, 
It was a very real and lethal thing. This guy always plays Nazis. I'm pretty sure he's in Downfall, and he's also the bad guy in The Monuments Men. So I presume this glider pilot, that he was in transit to the Arnhem area, and he didn't get it, didn't get that far. Mm. And going from the photos, it looks like he was taking pictures of Flak 88 guns as well as the coastal and naval artillery defenses that were in this vicinity um, that really made a lot of the region impenetrable. Uh, so valuable intelligence if that stuff can be handed off to an allied operative. You can have them if you and your friends rescue Dirac. Tim, you have to give me those. I have a sense, I have a sense she's moving chess pieces in a game she doesn't understand is gonna get pulled further into. The Canadians are uh, here. Yeah, and you lot are here. Here. Zealand, uh, Four years earlier, in May 1940, uh, right before the, the Netherlands uh, fell to the Nazis, I was the, the site of a rather heroic last stand on, on the part of, of Allied forces there. And then, of course, here we see the warriors revisiting that place in 1944, as the war often did in many places. <laughs> oh, many. Oh. What are you talking about? How many women have you had? <laughs> the gentleman does not disclose such uh. Not very good with the noise and light discipline here. It's about as good as their tactical formation as they walk into town. <laughs> so they took everything. Boys, listen. They're traitors, sir. Bloody traitors. Listen. Bunch of blue falcons. With this young lady trying to save her brother, I, I kind of like the, the ambiguity or the gray area, the middle ground, whatever you want to call it, of how even people who tried to stay out of the war, people who tried to stay neutral in these occupied zones, people had to make these very supreme decisions that would affect not only their lives, but the lives of their family. Um, and so, you know, what are the forces that, that make people, you know, revert to espionage and to assist the, the underground or the resistance in, in one form or another? Sometimes it's not out of patriotic zeal. Sometimes it's out of uh, a personal impulse or the, the need or necessity to do so. So, you know, I, I kind of like this, this middle ground that the, the characters sometimes have to navigate. Ugh. Phew. Such, uh, such tactics were uh, certainly in the Nazis' playbook, as we've seen from uh, the eyewitness accounts of many people who survived such turmoil. Some very elaborate set dressing here. Uh, it, it just it really looks the part, captures the flavor, and uh, likewise, the, the uniforms, the weaponry, the material culture uh, look very much spot on. Fritz, schau, was ich gefunden habe. Oh, man. <laughs> These sort of accidental up-close encounters uh, can be frequent on, on every battlefront, whether it be in a village or out in the woods. You sometimes have people just stumbling into each other. It creates these very tense and sometimes awkward moments. Lass 
Sätt dig på Ja, det är Nej, du suger på dem. Det är som har varit här för att skjuta. Fight small! Nu är ni med på att hålla. Skjut på dem. Skjut på dem. Skjut på dem. The whole showdown scene seems like a, a corporal upper moment here where people are torn by indecision as friends' lives are hanging in the balance. Uh, so, is it a war movie trope or is this, you know, is there something behind this in regard to, to human nature? No! 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 Oh, damn. Well, the, the lesson here is that he should have done as his officer told him and taken the shot because it would have turned out the same anyway. But then again, potentially killing your superior by accident would perhaps weigh greater on one's mind. I don't know. These sort of summary executions happen with such great frequency in September 44 as, as the Allies were at the gate. The Germans were, they were relentless in hunting down people. It didn't matter what the tactical or the strategic situation was, they kept at it because that is what they were trained to do. Uh, for as sinister as it is, that was the methodology behind their madness. It's at this point in the film where I'm really starting to get some like Christopher Nolan Dunkirk vibes because there's a sense of there's overlapping narratives where characters are interconnected even though their experiences are different and you know kind of the the, the ticking style of the soundtrack speaks to of all everything in this movie being time sensitive uh, which is a major theme of the of the movie Dunkirk. I mean, so uh, this is a a good companion piece of sorts. You know, for for fathers like this who realize that their their sons are about to meet their fates. You know, there has to be a, a dull sense of pain, knowing that one, you're not only going to potentially lose a loved one as a result of a firing squad, but everything that you did for the Germans, every soldier that you took care of, every sort of lenient or mutual gesture that you made toward them, it's all, it's all meaningless in the long run because the Nazis are going to do what the Nazis are going to do and they aren't going to necessarily care if you showed them affection or cared for your soldiers. They're going to do what they're told to do. Fire! No contact goes unpunished. I don't get it why this one British soldier stayed behind and just let his buddy go at it. Was it because he was afraid of going out in the water? I mean, you know, the, the British Airborne certainly had a similar ethos as, as American paratroopers. It, you know, it makes you wonder if so many of them, so proportionally, who were in that plane that crashed, I mean, you know, we have like half of them have disappeared. You know, they've, they've run off, they've deserted, they don't have the guts to, you know, row across the, the lake. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe... Did guys in real life have gr more grit than this? Or, you know, are we trying to break away at, you know, some old macho stereotypes? I don't know. They can attack them from here. <laughs> you can reach the allies. I can't do it. Now it's starting to feel a bit like 1917. Stop the attack. Stop the madness. And I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this. Um, our, our friendly viewer, Dave Mack, <laughs> you can tell me if I'm wrong here uh, with this. Uh, Volkerin? Volkerin Causeway? Uh, this was indeed a German strong point. And once again, all this has to do with the terrain. 
this is the perfect example of a tactical bottleneck. If you can limit your enemies routes of advance, you have complete control over their movements. And unfortunately, that is quite possibly here what is going to befall the Canadian troops on the other side of the waterway. So what are you? Um, Airborne? Yeah, yeah, English. And you're a... Uh, Canuck. Far from home. Yes. This is such a refreshing element of this movie because Canadians never get their due in World War II movies. Um, I had a, a rant on this point when talking about The Longest Day. You know, I think one of the great strengths of The Longest Day is that it shows so many nationalities and points of view, but the Canadians are left out of it. I mean, the Canadians hauled ass, you know, and the Western Front. And uh, at World War II, where they're talking about D-Day or subsequent campaigns, you know, they really did their part. You know, they, they fought as hard as any other, you know, allied nation uh, here in, in Western Europe. Uh, and so it's, it's long overdue that they get some screen time. And it looks like they're finally going to get it here in the Forgotten Battle. I think scenes like this are really telling because it shows us how these unlikely uh, friendships and camaraderies are, are formed uh, amidst the pressures of campaigns like this. And, you know, when one loses their family member, that often automatically turns them into someone who's all of a sudden very willing to work against the Germans, and perhaps previously they were not. Um, and so... It's a prime example of how the Germans' butchery often backfired upon them because they often killed people to send a message and to prevent uprisings, and oftentimes that only emboldened further uprisings and the likes of espionage against them. One reason why this region was so heavily fortified earlier in the war is because the Germans fully expected for the Allied invasion to arrive at the Pas de Calais, which was only a few dozen miles away uh, here from the, the River Scheldt. Um, and so a lot of these installations were put into place as with that mindset at play. And uh, yeah, oh geez. I did read it in an article prior to this. I was reading a review of this film. It didn't have any spoilers in it. That uh, one way that the director saved some, some money in filming this is that uh, he rehearsed his actors and extras, apparently for days at a time before filming. And in that way, everybody knew what they were doing when the cameras were actually rolling. And that was one cost-saving measure. And so... Uh, rehearsing as such for scenes like this that might involve hundreds of people. It's not a bad idea, logistically speaking. Will, come on. Will, we gotta go. Awesome, great cinematography here. The sun coming up over the horizon. Ah, oh, beautiful. And I believe some of the Canadian troops who were involved in this were part of uh, the very esteemed Black Watch. Hard fighters, heavily trained, and oh man, it's just not helping them here though. You know, a lot of war movies, when, when, when somebody loses a, a limb, when the, you see an arm or a leg getting blown off, it, it often looks really cartoonish. And I don't, I don't get that sense with, with these scenes at all. I mean, it, it, looks, it looks very real, and yet it's not overdone to the point that I think a movie like Hacksaw Ridge is. There's just a, a lot of great detail to be found in these scenes for as grisly as it is.
And so I, I certainly believe this part is, is granted. In fact, I, I recall hearing something of, uh, you know, one of the few places to take cover amidst this assault and ones like it with you know, these large impact craters that were in the ground and they offered these, these muddy burrows for, you know, dozens of men to, to take cover. And of course they, they become, you know, wedged uh, amidst the advance as a result. With the MG42 being fired, you can see all the, the crimped ends from, from the blanks, but hey, you know, can't shoot real bullets. You can't get, can't get everything, but that's just little stuff. Oh my God, this is just brutal. Moments like this, you know, you gotta wonder, you know, you know these uh, historical hypotheticals, you know, the, the Canadians here, they have these bolt action Lee Enfield rifles. What if they had had M1 Grands, you know, semi-automatic weapons that their American brethren had, you know, stuff like that where you can shoot off more rounds and a much quicker pace, you know, what sort of, what sort of difference would that have made in a firefight like this? You know, that's the sort of mind games I get into here when you think about the plight of the individual soldier. You know, in these scenes, especially where we look at the aftermath of this assault, you know, the, a good war movie can be made or broken in the little details. And, you know, you think about, you know, a character slipping on these mountains of brass, you know, thousands of rounds ejected out of these MG42s, you know, known as Hitler's buzzsaws, the Allied soldiers called them. Uh, you know, as our, as our producer Andy uh, mentioned to me a moment ago, a, a lesser film would have missed little details like that. But they, they certainly tally up on the, the point of realism. Come on, get them the photos. Do it. The fighting here on the causeway just got so gruesome. Uh, you know, from what I recall, you know, the, the Germans used flamethrowers to try to, you know, uh, break up the, the Canadian advance. And, you know, in these scenes here, uh, that these uh, night combat scenes, you know, what a, a lot of war movies don't capture, you know, like, once again, the little stuff, you know, and you think of like, uh, tracer rounds that, you know, were, you know, within the ammunition belts of the MG42s and, and things like that. Uh, you know, you see those things being shown here. Must have been ammunition in there if it created a fireball that big. You know, I spoke to a World War II Army Ranger, and uh, he said this sort of combat was the scariest type of fighting, because not only is there a sense of uncertainty and, and dread and the potential of shooting your own men in a night fight, but when you have to worm your way through an entrenched position, you don't know what's around the corner. Uh, it just takes it to a whole other level of, of heightened suspense and adrenaline. Uh, that is coursing through you. And uh, certainly I think that's what our, our characters are going through here. This poor sergeant's seen a lot. Glider crash, everyone else dies or abandons him. Swims across the water, gets lumped in with the Canadians, participates in multiple frontal assaults. This is a bad two day time. Oh, and here we go, the full circle come together here with our characters, the, the narrative arc. He's not going to do it. I have read of moments like this where, <laughs> you know, these rare moments where 
soldiers of opposite sides have their weapons drawn on each other, and they just kind of reach this, this silent consensus that, you know, if, <laughs> if they both do their job, they're both going to end up dying, and they just kind of nod their heads and agree to walk away and pretend that this didn't happen. So it may seem like a theatrical absurdity, but I've heard of Stranger Things. The battle in this vicinity in real life was, was waged over about a month and a half's time and uh, eventually the Allies did push through and they did gain control of the riverway but at, at an immense cost. I believe 12 or 13,000 Allied casualties here in, in this sector and over half of them were Canadian losses and so once again yeah, I'm just glad to see the Canadians here getting their due uh, because so rarely are their heroics depicted in cinema. And, you know, as to my point earlier, they just couldn't walk away. They, they always had to have the, the last word in regard to civilian populations who uh, at the last minute thought that they ousted the Germans. Hard to say if such a thing would have actually happened. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency to create a, a sympathetic character that is the the exception, you know, to everybody else around him. Uh, you know, we, we see something kind of similar in Clint Eastwood's Letters from Iwo Jima, in which uh, the the key protagonist, you know, he's he's a sympathetic character. We don't actually see him shooting at Americans or you know Allied service members, and it, it's very very similar. With, with this character here in, in this circumstance in the battle that, that he just went through. If nothing else, I think a scene like this gets across the point, you know, it, wars hurt young people more than anybody else. We see two young people here from, you know, kind of opposite sides of the spectrum to an extent who's Lives have just completely been turned upside down as a result of all this in very, very painful ways. And regardless of any theatrical liberties, I mean, I think scenes like this are a vivid reminder of that harsh reality. And the significance of Antwerp did, did not diminish thereafter because, uh, indeed, um, in December of 1944, with Hitler's last gamble with the Ardennes Offensive, he hoped to push the Allied forces back to Antwerp to reclaim that harbor, push the Allies back to the sea. And so uh, even many weeks and months after this, uh, that port city remained of high strategic importance. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, one of the, the really important things to keep in mind here is the, the dramatic cost inflicted upon civilian populations uh, with campaigns like this and as a result of the, the consequences of occupation. Uh, somewhere around 300,000 uh, individuals from the Netherlands were, were killed during the Second World War. And... Uh, many of them were lost uh, during this time of September, October 1944 as uh, the ripple effects of Operation Market Garden were, were being experienced. So, uh, there you have it, my very first ever genuine reaction video. And uh, if, if nothing else, uh, this movie has me wanting to learn more about these, these various battles and campaigns that took place in these regions of Belgium and the Netherlands. And I think that's a good indicator of what a solid history movie can do. Uh, if it leaves you wanting to learn more and to pick up a book uh, after you've watched the film, then I think that it has succeeded in some small way. 
All things considered, I think that this was a solidly crafted war film. It was very authentic in regard to the material culture, the ambience, the settings, uh, the set dressing, uh, the weaponry. Uh, it, it, it held up very, very well in all of these regards. And even though it was a, a fictionalized take on these momentous happenings with fictitious characters for the most part, uh, I really appreciated the human element that was brought into the storyline showing us how, you know, the actions of individuals affect the other actions of other individuals and it leads to a domino effect accordingly. And there have been so many instances of that and in so, so many battles uh, throughout history. Uh, but above all else, as the title would suggest, uh, I'm just really pleased that this has exposed uh, a very wide audience of people through Netflix viewers and whatnot, uh, a truly forgotten battle. Uh, I guarantee you 95% of the viewers had probably never heard of, of this battle beforehand. And even I had only vaguely, you know, had been aware of it uh, up until this point. Uh, and so, you know, whether we consider the contributions of folks from the Netherlands uh, the, the Canadians especially, as I mentioned a little bit ago, uh, giving people credit where credit is due is a very important factor in historical films. Uh, so i definitely give this movie uh, a thumbs up in that regard. And if you haven't had the chance to watch it in its entirety, then I definitely encourage you to do so. Uh, as I always do as we're wrapping things up here, I like to recommend various readings and perhaps other films. And uh, one book that I'd definitely like to recommend, I don't have the hard copy with me though, it's, it's in my office, so we'll, we'll put up an image of it. And that book is called Dutch Girl by Robert Matson, And that is the story of Hollywood actress Audrey Hepburn, who was living in the Netherlands during World War II, how she was involved in the underground movement, how her friends and family members were consumed into these circumstances of the Second World War. And to give you a perspective of what young women, like the characters who we saw in this film, often had to contend with, um, I think it's just a really good book that has some really rich perspective. I would uh, also like to recommend, recommend another film, and it, it perhaps might be one that we will be examining uh, at a later point in our series, and that is the film Winter in Wartime. This one likewise takes place in Holland uh, in the early winter of 1945, and I think where this movie excels um, and where it has some similarities to uh, The Forgotten Battle um, is that it shows how these otherwise neutral individuals perhaps are drawn into uh, circumstances and actions that often, you know, find themselves in over their heads as a result. Uh, and so, you know, the idea of who are you loyal to? How can you do this sort of balancing act while there's an enemy force occupying your country? Uh, I think... Uh, this film, Winter in Wartime, does an equally good job of bringing up some of those moral dilemmas and ambiguities that people in the Netherlands had to contend with. Uh, something else uh, that many of you will undoubtedly find of interest um, is that Real History has a forthcoming website. This will have additional features. It will have, of course, a link to our videos, uh, things will be kind of thematically presented in a way. And I think one of the greatest assets that our forthcoming website will have is that it will have educational material, questions, and things that teachers and educators can tie into classroom curriculum to serve as benchmarks and foundations for how to have discussions with students about historical films in the classroom. So we have that and much more on the way. So with that, we're so glad that you tuned in to watch this first reaction video here on Real History. I suspect there will be many more to come. And uh, please feel free to uh, leave some comments below. Have you seen this movie? What did you like about it? Was there anything that surprised you? And as always, we always welcome your suggestions as to what films 
we might be able to analyze next. In the meantime, once more, we invite you to also check out our Real History store. Get yourself some classy swag, support our channel so we can continue to bring you this quality content. So with all that said, we'll see you next time on Real History.